Now we're turning, please, this evening to the book of Daniel in chapter 2. It's not the first time that we've looked at this passage together, but I've felt during the week burdened and uh, drawn toward this particular chapter and just some simple thoughts uh, to draw out from it. Daniel chapter 2, by way of connection, we're reading from verse 48, following the uh, dream that the king had, King Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel was given by the Lord the ability and gift to interpret that dream, and then how the Lord turned events in favor of Daniel, and what Daniel did with that favor. We read in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 48, Then the king made Daniel a great man, and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now, by way of connection to the story, I'm going to break in at the latter part of verse 7. And the, uh, really the background is that Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 had set up uh, an idol, an idol of his own making, and he had proclaimed that men were to bow down and worship that idol. And we read of these men, they were unwilling to do so. And in v- verse 8, we read... Uh, of chapter 3, verse 8, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sagbut, uh, psaltery, and de- uh, dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshippeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at the time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer and kinds of music ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well but if ye worship not ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands Shadrach Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar we are not careful to answer thee in this matter if it be so our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. The form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace won seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that they were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counsellors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made a dunghill, but there is no other, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen, and God will bless the public reading of his word. Let's unite in prayer again. Our Father, we thank thee for thy living word, and we bless thee that thy word is quick and powerful. And Lord, you have given us thoughts from this portion of your word. And I pray, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, the letter killeth, the Spirit giveth life. And I pray for that anointing that breaks every yoke. I pray, O God, thou would grant it just now. And that, Lord, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit upon the word of God, O God, hear us. To this end, Lord, afresh, all that I have and am, I gladly give it unto thee. I claim thy cleansing and sanctifying power on my spirit soul and body, and for the honour and the glory of the Lord Jesus, our lovely Saviour, I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost, I take, and I thank thee that he, the Holy Spirit, will undertake in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. I want to speak to you very simply this evening on three lights in the darkness. Three lights in the darkness. The Lord Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. And in so doing, he said, they will see your good works. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. And Christianity and our relationship with the Lord is often portrayed as being a light, a light. And here in the Old Testament, at a time of persecution when Israel was taken into captivity and into Babylon, in the first chapter, if you take time to read it, you'll discover that Daniel, along with his three friends, were taken, along with many others. They were not just the ordinary five-eighths in Israel. But very much they were the aristocracy. They were those who came from princes. Those who were born into high and wealthy homes. And the king had demanded that they be taken and brought into his court. That there they may be used or utilized for the good of the Babylonian kingdom. And so these men were displaced from their home. They knew what it was to be separated from parents and to go through many painful experiences in their formative years 
Just like the Holocaust, whenever the Jews were wrenched away from loved ones, taken away from wherever they had lived in Europe to be brought for the gas chambers. In like manner, these people were taken away and they were put in another very strange environment, Babylon. But they, ado they adopted into it to a degree. And you know the lovely thing about being the Lord's child is that even in the darkness and when you're in a strange environment, the Lord says, I will lead, a, lead the blind by a way which they knew not. And God can take you even in situations where you have no experience, even though it's brand new territory for you. The Lord goes before and he knows that territory. And he is your re for reward. He, he goes before you as your armor bearer. And he comes as your real reward behind you. And God will be to you all that you need. And he certainly was and proved himself to be to these three men. Three lights in the darkness. Well, the darkness is found in this passage as they were taken from their native land and from the law of God into a very, very much pagan and idolatrous system in Babylon where God was not regarded, but they basically bowed down to the gods of their own making. And what I want you to see, first of all, from this passage is the power of idolatry. The power of idolatry. And what we mean by idolatry here is the replacing of God with other gods. God, the God of heaven is displaced and other gods take his place. Now these three young men in their formative years have come to a knowledge of the Lord. They have trusted the Lord and their confidence is in him. And in the Old Testament manner of things, they were saved people. They were born again in the Old Testament terms because they trusted God. They entered in by faith and they looked forward to the sacrifice of the Messiah. They were looking by faith to the Lord for salvation. And they were his children. But you know, they were brought into an environment wherein from their youth they loved the Lord into a very dark, dark situation. You know, it has been said truthfully that the darker it is, then the light shines all the brighter. And when you're in a dark room where there's no light, and even you take a match and light it, my, the, the difference that that little match makes is unbelievable. And so you shine best, and you work best when you're in the deepest and the darkest situations. You see, in this time when idolatry was predominant, these three men were being pressurized. It was like being inside a pressure cooker. Now, I don't know if you have found this, but I think for any Christian in the environment, certainly of Northern Ireland, it's like living in a pressure cooker. If you want to serve the Lord today, you are pressurized. Even in an unseen manner, you might not be aware of it. There may be nothing directly said to you, but there are spiritual uh, pressures placed upon you. And that's exactly what was happening here. These men were being constantly pressurized. Now, how do we know that? Well, first of all, it's the very nature of the devil to oppose and withstand the child of God. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith. You see, we read in verse uh, 7 that these men who came, or in verse 8 rather, it said, Wherefore at the time a certain Jews came near, or certain Chaldeans came near, and accused the Jews. Now, how could these men, Chaldeans or Babylonians, how could they lift an accusation unless they had been watching them? They were being watched. There were pe personalities who were scrutinizing every move of these three lights, these three men of God. 
And we may not be watched to the same extent by the world or by people in the world, but you and I should be aware that we are scrutinized by devilish beings. That our lives are constantly under the scrutiny of the powers of darkness. For the devil is always seeking whom he may devour. There is always eyes upon us and that for our harm and for our destruction. And so it was for these men. They were not only accused, but they were planned against. These men, when they brought the news to the king, it wasn't merely to give him some information. It wasn't purely that they were wanting to be good citizens. These men had something in the back of their mind. Not only were they personalities looking at these three men, but they had an objective in their personality, and the objective was the destruction of the three men. They wanted these three lights snuffed out, they were quite prepared to have these three men as long as their light didn't shine. And the devil is not one bit concerned about crowds. The devil's not one bit concerned whether we have many or few. That doesn't matter. It is the amount of light that goes out from the individual or group of individuals that uh, causes the devil to concentrate his armies and his legions. They were accused and plotted against. You see, the Bible tells us of the Lord Jesus. You remember he spoke to Peter and he said, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he may sift thee as wheat. The Lord knew that. And he said, that's the desire. And the Lord knew that. He said, Satan has a desire for you, Peter. Why? Because uh, the devil is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. He doesn't have all knowledge. But he can read things. He can see the scope of the, of the flow of the land. He can see God's hand on an individual. He can see the way that God's guiding a person. He can listen to our words and he knows what we say. And so the devil has many tactics to try and see the direction we're going. And he can, he can tell if a person is set aside for a specific ministry or a calling. And so he concentrates. The devil knows our weaknesses in secret. The devil knows the areas where we would feel the Lord. He's aware of all these things. This would cause us to have great despair. Were it not for the fact that we have a greater one with us, even our Lord Jesus. Well, Jesus said, Satan hath desired to have thee, but I have prayed for thee. The Lord Jesus said, Peter, I have intervened personally. And I'm sure when we get to glory, we'll be amazed at the number of times that the Lord himself intervened in our lives. Where he prayed for us and where he came to our aid. The Bible says, not if, but when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against him. So you see the power of idolatry with these three youngish men. But not only that, we can notice God's favor. God's favor. Now this is a lovely truth in the Word of God. And it's something that should warm the heart of every true Christian who seeks to follow the Lord. That the Lord can put favor in your life. That the Lord can favor you in every area and department of your life. If you will but trust him and love him and commit your way to him and seek to walk with him, you can consciously become aware of God giving you favor in the sight of man. We find this happen in, in the early chapters, and it no doubt had a deep influence on these men. In chapter 1 and verse 9, when we read of Daniel being brought before uh, along with the others, and they were going to test them to get them into the king's palace, uh, he said they'd have to eat all the meat that was presented. And Daniel was the spokesman. Daniel was the foreman uh, among them. 
and he had purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. And we read that later on in the same chapter, they followed with Daniel. They were going with him and they chose to follow Daniel's example. And it says in verse 9 of the same occasion when, when Daniel takes this stand for the Lord. It says, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. The Lord can give favor. And I don't know if you have discovered that in your lifetime, but I certainly have. I'm amazed when I look back over the years when I see the times that God gave us favor and tender love. Something we could never have got other than the grace of God, that God was just merciful. And God moved on hearts and God caused people to have love and favor. And that's something of his doing. But it's a wonderful thing because God can do it in our lives. You see, the Lord had been good to them through their friend. And the, this favor of God can manifest in many, many ways. There is no shortage or no, no, no uh, limitation on the diversity of, of God manifesting these benefits and blessings and his favor. You see, in chapter 2, we read at the beginning of these men that whenever they were in friendship with Daniel, Daniel was given a unique position. The Lord uh, gave him favor and he, the Lord gave him the dream and then the king gave him favor and made him prince over all Babylon. And once he got favor, the first thing he did was he said, I have three friends and I want you to put them in position. Now, there was great wisdom in that because Daniel not only wanted to bless his three brethren. And you know, if you're going on with the Lord, one of the things that happens in your heart when God blesses you is that there's something in you that wants to bless God's people. You just want to bless everybody and do what you can for them. And Daniel was in a position to bless. And when we're in a position to bless, we should do it. When we're in a position to do good to others, we should do it. Because we might not always find ourselves in that position. But here he was, and he gave these three men position because they would have responsibility. And Daniel knew that there would be a good, there would be good would come from these three men being in high positions. Because righteousness exalts the nation, and sin is a reproach to any people. And so they were put into this high place. God had been good. God had just given these men favor through their friend. See the way God can give favor. Well, he can give it in relationships. Do you remember Joseph? You want to turn with me or if you just want to listen, it's in Genesis 39 and verse 21. <clears throat> and we read of, of uh, this character, uh, Jacob. And this particular truth is most manifest in the life of Joseph. And in chapter 39 and verse 21, we read these lovely words about Joseph. In chapter 39 and verse 21, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So the truth coming through is that God can give favor to you and I through people, through relationships. God can touch a person. And that person's heart can be changed toward you. And whereas they would discount you or disregard you or pass you by, God by his power makes them be sympathetic to you. That's a lovely truth. Because in the rough and tumble of life with the difficulties that come for you and I, either in the workplace or the home or the family, where there are so many difficulties coming, as we seek the Lord, the Lord can give us favor from the most unexpected sources. And we should ever be mindful and thankful to him for that. Not only is God's favor manifest in relationships, but it is also manifest in our calling. We read of uh, Hezekiah when he came to the throne in 2 Kings 18 and 6. It says that the Lord was with him and he prospered. And you read the early part of the chapter where Hezekiah honored the Lord from he got to the throne. He, there was never a king like him before in Judah. 
But it says that the Lord was with him and he prospered him. And you know, God can prosper you. God can put his hand on decision making in business. Now I know sadly today there are many people who have prospered and many Christians have prospered. But they have did it not under the blessing of God but by deceit and tax evasion and such things. That's never the blessing of God. That will come into judgment. And that such money again brings actually far from God's blessing but a curse in on the family. But there are lives and there are people, God, for his own sovereign reasons, God sets some people apart and he gives them wisdom and understanding and discernment and entrepreneurability. And they're able to utilize that gift for business or whatever and God prospers them. And then he guides them in how to use it. But here you find the king is prospered by the favor of the Lord. Not only is it manifest in relationships and in, in, in callings, but also in a time of adversity. You see, in, when, when everything's going wrong in our lives, we sometimes wonder, you know, what is happening here? Well, Jacob found himself in that position. Jacob came to a time where Laban, his father-in-law, was treating him ill. In fact, had been for a long time. And in Genesis 3, verse 4 to 7, we read, and <clears throat> I think it's Genesis chapter 30 rather, Jacob is leaving uh, Laban. And whenever he's leaving, he, he says to his wife, uh, we're going to go now. He says, your father's countenance is against me. And he said to him, the scripture says in that latter part of the verse, it says, but God suffered him, or he's talking about Laban. He said, your father-in-law that changed my wages 10 times and done me ill, he said, God hath not suffered him to hurt me. In other words, he said, I've had a rough time, but the Lord hasn't let Laban do me any harm. He changed my wages ten times. In other words, everything that he had planned against me was nothing but bad. And you know, on the journey of life, you can find yourself where people are planning ill against you. But as you honor the Lord, the Lord can cause that to turn. Do you remember Balaam, the old false prophet? And he got up on the hillside and he started to uh, raise his curse upon Israel. And when he opened his mouth, the Spirit of God came on him. And rather than curse Israel, he blessed it. And every time, no matter what he was to do to curse the enemies of the king, yet every time he opened his mouth, the Spirit of God would come. And he turned around and he said, I cannot curse those whom God hath blessed. God's favor is a wonderful thing. Then I want you to notice about these three men. The power of friendship. Friendship. Did you ever, ever take time to think about the friends that God has given you on the road of life? Did you ever imagine what it would be like to be all on your own and not to have a friend? Did you ever think of the goodness of God in giving you friends? God's good. God's good. Especially those who are elderly. Especially those who are maybe living on their own. Do you ever thank God for friendship? Do you know it's great to have people that you can turn to, people that you can trust, people you can confide in, people that can support you. It's a great thing to have. Did you know there are tens of thousands, maybe millions of people in Britain tonight and they are absolutely abandoned and lonely? talking to a man last week he was out in Romania and he said I went to a place where there were two women he said they had no families and they had no friends they weren't Christians and he said there they sat and he said I started to talk to one of them and he said the tears started to roll down her face an old woman he said she could barely lift a cup to drink and he said one of the workers said afterwards he said if that little woman if we weren't here to give her something, he said, that wee woman would die. There's not a person who would take the time to lift a cup to that woman's mouth. Friendship. The kindred spirit. The Bible says, a friend loveth at all times. 
And so a true friend is a friend that whenever the relationship starts, it continues and it builds and it strengthens and it goes on and it continues right to death and I believe it will continue in eternity. A true friendship. And a real friend loveth at all times, not just in the good times, but in the bad times. That's when we appreciate a friend most, when we're at our lowest, when we've took a fall, whenever not nobody else is interested in us, and the friend is there. It's great to have a friend. The Bible says in Proverbs 27 and verse 10, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. What the Proverbs was teaching there was the value of not only your own friendships, but even, he says, the friendships of your father. You know, some people uh, are very, very unwise in that they squander friendships. They take for granted people and friendships and they squander them. And they lose them lightly without any desire to be reconciled over an issue. But friendships become a very important part in our lives. Big part. I remember a man on one occasion. He was in the Lord's work. And if I mentioned him, many of you would know him. And what had happened was, my wife and I had more of my wife than I, but it was over an issue to do with music. And it had been advertised all over the province, and we felt it was very dishonoring to the Lord. And we contacted this particular person, and uh, he would do nothing about it. And then we contacted the person who was over that man, and we explained, and he, he didn't seem interested in it, didn't seem it was an issue, he didn't see it as being important, didn't quite understand, to be honest with you. And my wife wrote him a letter. And I remember two days later, this man of God, for that's what he is, he rang. And he said, I've got a letter. And he said, I need to talk to your wife. He said, I cannot lose this friendship. I cannot break this relationship over such an issue. He says, I can't afford to lose this. This relationship is too valuable to us. And my dear friends, that man appreciated, it's just by way of illustration, but he appreciated the value of a friendship. Don't squander them. Don't lose them quickly or lightly. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. The value of a friend. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. The value of a friend. A true friend you can bear your heart to. A true friend you can take sometimes a rebuke from because you know the motivation of their heart. I have a dear friends who have come to me over the years and they have sometimes rebuked me and I accepted it because I knew the motivation of their heart. I knew that they meant me well. I knew that they were trying to preserve me in the long term and I accepted their rebuke. Iron sharpeneth iron. All right, very quickly. What these three lights, these three men learned was that summer can turn to winter quickly. You see, they had got a new job, and prospects were up. It was a big job. It was a top diplomat. They had got the cars coming, the big limousines to lift them and carry them as, as a spokesman for the king. And in no time, they're going to be thrown in the fire. You see, Christianity can be like a May Day. It can be sun in the morning and snow at night. And that can happen. Summer can turn to winter in the Christian life. And you see, the Bible tells us to boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And how often in life's journey, God, even as we, as we continue on with him, suddenly we can find ourselves turned in from, from the brightness of the awareness of the blessing of God to an occasion where it seems that God has forsaken us all in a day. 
I look back on one particular occasion whenever uh, Rachel and I went through, uh, perhaps it was the worst experience we ever had uh, to be tested by the Lord. And we, everything had started out uh, over a period of about three or four days. Everything looked so rosy. It just was working. God had guided us in a direction regarding selling our last home. And we knew his hand in it. And we moved along. And it was all working perfectly. And everything was just like clockwork. And we could so see God in it. And then all of a sudden... Somebody put a spanner into the works. Suddenly a phone call came through. And I can remember going to, at that time, we had just moved to Lurgan to live. And I can remember the first time I ever walked around Lurgan Park. It was about nine o'clock at night in the dark. And I walked around and I cried until I could cry no more. Wondering why God had let happen what he had let happen. Why so much had went wrong. I'll never forget that. But I learned that God can turn the summer to winter just as these three men learned, but also that God is not only in control of the summer, but God is in control of the winter. He's in control of both. What else do we learn from these men quickly? Well, we learn the truth of no compromise. That's the primary truth from these three men, no compromise. You see, these men were offered the opportunity to bow down to another idol, but they wouldn't do it. He said, if you bow down, you're free men, you're back to your jobs, all's well. well why don't you do it? Well, whenever the devil comes to you and I, he, he, he'll tempt us because compromise always seems attractive. Take an easier route. Why get into a big fight over it? Why take your stand over an issue? It's, not, it's no big thing. But you see, these men's hearts were out and out to the Lord. And these men, it was very clear to them. There, there, was no, there was no compromise for them because they knew the word of God. And the word of God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. It was clear. And when you come to scripture that's explicitly clear, you can't compromise. Or it's spiritual suicide. And so they wouldn't. Do you remember Joseph whenever he found himself in the predicament with Potiphar's wife? And he said, I cannot sin against the Lord. Can't sin against God. That's where I find myself. And you see, friends, the lovely thing about these three men is that this wasn't the first time this had happened. Not that long before, they had stood again, but this time they had been in the background. And they had watched Daniel. And Daniel said, I won't, I won't defile myself. And these three young men were impressed by Daniel. And their hearts were moved. They saw the courage and the tenacity of Daniel to stand up against the Babylonians for the Lord and for the God of the land they loved, the God of Israel. And so they remembered, no doubt, Daniel's stand. And you see, you and I can be influenced by other Christians or by ministry of the word, but God brings you and I into situations where we have to make the decision ourselves. You can't live off somebody else's story or about how they tr trusted God, how God met them, how they had no compromise and they stood for the Lord. The Lord will see to it that you will come to the place where you'll have to stand too. Otherwise, you'll never grow spiritually. They had been influenced by Daniel. Now, I want you to notice very quickly as we draw near to the close that spiritual people still have uncertainties. That's a valuable truth. Spiritual people still have uncertainties. You know, there's some people and they say, unless they're saying all the time, the Lord showed me this and the Lord told me to do that. And every wee detail the Lord told them to do. Well, that's okay if the Lord does that, but he doesn't do that with me. He doesn't do that with me. The Lord, I have found over the years, can show you some things very clearly. But a lot of things you've just got to walk by faith and look to the Lord. You've got to make wise decisions in what wisdom God gives you. And these men didn't know 
What they did know was the word of God said that they were not to bow down to other gods. They knew that bit. But whenever they stood before the king, they said, we are not careful to answer thee. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us and he will deliver us from thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known. In other words, we don't know. We have no idea. God, God didn't meet with us an hour before the Holy Ghost come upon us and tell us that we're going to be delivered. There was no angels appeared. We are going into this blind. We are prepared to die. We have nothing from God to show us that anything's going to happen by way of deliverance. But all we want you to know and all we want heaven to know is that far as we're concerned that if it means dying for the Lord, we'll die for him. Do you think they weren't spiritual because they didn't have the answer? Spiritual people can have uncertainties. Nobody knows everything. Do you remember Esther? Remember Esther when she was Mordecai gets into the palace and he said, listen, that old Haman boy, he's going to kill the Jews. God has put you, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You're God's deliverer. Oh, but she says, what if I die? He says, well, he says, don't you be thinking that if we die that you'll get off. And he talked to her. And then she said to him, well, I want, I want the Jews to fast. And she says, I'll go into the king. You're not allowed to go into the king unless you're called into his presence. And she said, I will go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Same principle. The Jews are on the line. The work of God's on the line. The, the, the enemy has come in in the form of Haman. And we're going to be extinguished. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, take all that it takes. I'm, I, I'm dying to everything. And if it means me literally dying, then I'll do that. And God intervened for Esther. Now I'm not saying that God will intervene in every case. But the point is, those are the lights that shine the brightest. These people have all something in common. They're thoroughly out and out for God. They are totally committed to him. There's no half measure with Esther or with, or with the three, three, three men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They're out and out for God. Spiritual people still have uncertainties. Fire produces freedom. Fire produces freedom. These men were thrown into the fire. And the Bible says that they were tied up in their coats and their garments. And they were just like the man coming out of the tomb. They were bound hand and foot. And yet whenever they were thrown into the fire, isn't this amazing? When they were thrown into the fire, their clothes didn't burn. When they were thrown into the fire, their hair didn't burn. When they were thrown into the fire, uh, it, nothing belonging to their person was burned. And the Bible says they weren't even singed, but the ropes that were on them burned off. In other words, everything that hinders you from being all that God wants you to be, it is the fire and the fire alone that will set you free. The fire of the Holy Spirit. The fire of God's testings lead to freedom and that's why we should not withstand nor should we ever say to God I will not go through it I often have come to the place now where I say to the Lord Lord I don't enjoy any of the fires and I don't but Lord if it's for my well-being if it's for my good in eternity help me to go down the route you want me to go and give me great grace that's what I pray Fire produces freedom. You see, not only did these men in that fire, not only did everything that hindered them and everything that restricted them was broken off, but they met the Lord. They met the Lord in the fire. And you meet the Lord in the fire. The presence of God is most acutely felt by those who have been in deepest trial and deepest uh, testings under the Lord. It is there the Lord reveals himself. I was with a lady this week. I was telling some of the friends, and she's, she's, she's dying presently with cancer unless the Lord breaks in. 
And there she sat serenely in the chair, a relatively young woman with a young family. And I said, well, how are you? It's very hard sometimes to know what to say to folk. And she looked at me and she says, I'm just waiting to get home. I'm just waiting to get home. The Lord drawing near. The presence of God filling and surrounding the believer. I remember watching a program a few years ago about a man who decided to go up one plateau after another. It was a location, I think, in South America where they travelled up and up and up. And the problem was the ground at the bottom was being taken over by wealthier people and they were pushed up, these people. They had to live higher and higher and they brought their animals with them. And their animals over the years had adopted to higher altitudes and so would the people until they went right up to this plateau where, where you, you felt you were, you were near the moon. And the man who was doing the interview said that when he got halfway up the mountain where these people were, he said they were just, just walking. He was out of breath. Shortage of oxygen. The air t- 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 too high. And he said the fact that these people and their animals, he said, could breathe so easily is that they had been in the heights so long that their lungs had expanded. And he said they could cope adequately in such an altitude, whereas you and I would die. And you see, as the Lord brought these ones into the fire, he was expanding them. He was expanding their understanding of God, their experiences of God. Fire produces freedom. Finally, I've used it often, we've often sang it, but it's very true. Little is much when God is in it. You see, in chapter 3 and verse 26 and 27, we read these words. And whereas they commanded to leave... I better get the right chapter. 26, 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. He spake to the three of them, said, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come thither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. The princes, governors, captains, kings, counselors, there's some crowd of them. There wasn't just one of them standing at the, at the, at the fiery furnace. The whole of the government, the whole, the whole of the dignitaries of the nation were standing. They're all standing there. Being gathered together saw these men. They all saw it. And God saw to it that they all saw it. Upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Hair was not singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Can you see these governors and boys getting them and pushing them around and sniffing at them? Boy, there's not even a hair burning your head. Be astounded out of a fire that melted people that went near it. Why is God doing this? Why did God intervene? Well, him that honoreth me, I will honor. I know that. But the thing is, God, on this occasion, broke into these men's lives, not only in honoring their faith, but also in honoring and glorifying his own name. You see, these three men had a desire from from their youth to honor the Lord. They they loved Israel, they loved Jerusalem, they loved the house of God, but all was gone now. And so along with Daniel, they're, they're just serving the Lord where the Lord has put them. And it's not an easy spot, but the Lord has put them there. And they love him and they're honoring him. I can just imagine that in the hearts of these men, there was a longing. If they really loved the Lord and they did, there would have been a longing in them that others would know the Lord. That others would be saved. And if you imagine these three boys sitting down like today and say, listen, let's have a campaign. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can imagine them. What can we do to change things? Well, they can't change it. The thing that we should be asking is, and we ask ourselves, is what can God do through us to change things? 
These men never had any pre-plan. They're just walking with God. That's all they're doing. They're not trying to think how to do this, do that, so that God does this. They don't have that kind of ability or wisdom. They're just going on with God. They're confronted with idolatry. They do what the Bible tells them. They honor the Lord. They obey him on the journey of life. And out of it, God sends out a message across all the kingdom that he's God. Little is much when God is in it. You see, it was just one isolated and relatively common event for people to be burned. It was just three people who were from Jewish background, weren't Babylonians anyway, who were thrown into a fire for rebellion. It wasn't any big issue. But because God intervened into that situation, as a result, the message was sent out. Therefore, I make a decree, every people, nation, and language which speak anything. Boy, that would cover Tony Blair's government would be in trouble there. He said, I make a decree. This is, this is the monarch of the greatest empire of the day. I'm making a decree as a dictator. If there is, to every people, nation, and language, if any of them speak anything amiss, Anything contrary to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that person shall be cut in pieces. In other words, if somebody gets up in parliament and curses God, the decree has gone out, he'll be cut in pieces. And their houses will be a dunghill. In other words, bulldozers and bombs will be planted at their grand, great, big homes, and they'll be brought to rubble. Because there is no God that can deliver after this sort. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, this mountain shall be removed. You see, brothers and sisters, it is not us or our ideas that can bring what's necessary to the land. It is you and I seeking to walk humbly with God in love to one another and love to the Lord and obeying as God would send light and being uh, unwilling to compromise where God, uh, the enemy, would present a choice before us to go through with God in our lives individually and collectively that the Lord himself intervenes in the smallest of situations in the most isolated and the most ridiculous places that God would manifest his almighty power to such a degree that men of influence and men of power and men in government would bow and say this is the Lord do you believe today that That God could do the same thing today. Oh not in the same way. For God has a thousand ways to answer every prayer. But do you think God would have any real difficulty. In bringing a nation. From where it is. In paganism. To a place where it would fear the Lord. I know you believe that. And I believe it. And that's why I have learned over the years to never despise the day of small things. And never to forget that it only takes one match to burn the forest. Just one match. Just a little fire to do the work. God help us to be the lights for this day and for this age. Let's bow in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank thee, Lord, for the help of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for your wonderful word. And, O God, we pray that, Lord, the same Spirit that was in these three men would abide and rest 
in us, Lord. And Father, in this day, this short brief time on earth, this little life, Lord, that will soon be gone, oh, we pray in Jesus' name that you will take that little life and, Father, that from it, as it goes into the ground to die, that, Lord, great fruit will come. And we pray, Lord, that men and women in days to come around about us in the land of Ireland will be crying out, there is no God that delivers like this God. Oh, hear us, we pray. And, Lord, move soon amongst us. And keep us looking ever to thee. In Jesus' name. Amen.